Hello, fifth graders, and welcome to a read aloud of today's science ebook titled Food Chains and Webs. As needed for today's science lesson, Unit 3, Lesson 8 Producers, Consumers, and Decomposers. So, how are producers, consumers, and decomposers organized into a food web? Let's read to find out, pages 4 through 28 in the ebook today. So, perhaps you've learned about food chains and webs in some of your earlier grades. But what are the living things in a food web or food chain that we call the producers? What are the living things that we call consumers? And what are the ones that we call decomposers? We'll be learning about the three different roles that living things can play in a food chain or food web today. So let's go and take a look at that. By getting ourselves to page four, starting with, what is a food chain? Where do you get all the energy that you need to grow, play, and do the things that you like to do? Energy comes from the food that you eat. Every time you consume a hamburger, a glass of milk, a piece of fish, or broccoli, you are taking in nourishment and energy. At the same time, you are part of a food chain and a food web. Getting in line on the food chain. Every living thing must have food to survive. A food chain shows how living things get their food. At the bottom of the food chain are producers. So what are the producers? These are organisms that are able to create their own food, uh, namely plants, right, through photosynthesis. Plants are examples of producers. Every link of the chain after the producer is a consumer, or a living thing that consumes or eats another. Consumers are organisms that must eat food that already exists. So they can't make their own food, they gotta find something else to eat to get their energy. Animals are consumers. Some may eat plants, while others may eat other animals. So here's an example of how a food chain works. The sun boils down on the African plain. Trees and shrubs use the energy from the sun to grow. So energy from the sun is used to help the plants grow. A herd of giraffes comes along looking for plants to eat. So the giraffes eat the plant in order to get that energy for themselves. So the giraffes nibble on the trees and shrubs. And then a pride of hungry lions spot the giraffes. The lions chase, catch, and eat a few of the giraffes. So the lions then eat the giraffes, and so the lion now gets some of that energy for itself. This food chain starts out with energy from the sun that strikes the earth. Plants are able to change the energy from the sun into their own food. They cannot use all the energy, so they store it in their stems, leaves, and roots. This stored energy is a source of food called carbohydrates. They've heard about carbohydrates before. Uh, we humans eat those as well. Some animals eat the plants to get energy to live and reproduce. Other animals eat these animals and collect the energy that is within their bodies. Each link in a food chain is food for the next link. Energy passes from the plants to one link after another on the food chain. Not all of the energy is passed up the food chain. Some energy is used up as heat in the organism's body or is lost as waste material. Each organism that forms a link in a food chain passes on to the next link less energy than it receives. Still, the final link in the food chain is dependent on the first, the producers. A food chain usually has only four or five links. If a chain had more links than that, the animals at the end of the chain would not receive enough energy, or food or energy, to grow and reproduce. So in that particular food chain, uh, the arrows are showing the passage of energy from one living thing to the next. Energy from the sun, is absorbed by the plants, which is taken into the giraffes when they eat the plants, and then that energy is transferred to the lion uh, whenever the lion eats the giraffes. Important to note, though, that with each step in the food chain, there's a little bit less energy for the animal that comes next. Most animals are part of more than one food chain. They must seek out different kinds of food to meet their energy needs. Food chains are connected to other food chains to form food webs. So that's the other main way we organize the passage of energy uh, from one living thing to another. Food webs. So right there is a picture of a food web. So it contains basically uh, about four or five different food chains all linked together. Animal dependence. All the animals in a food web are dependent on one another, meaning they need one another. It may seem cruel that the lions hunt down and kill the giraffes, but if one group of animals increases or decreases too much, the food web is out of balance. If the animals don't hunt and kill some of the giraffes, then there will be too many giraffes. Too many giraffes means that there will not be enough plants to provide the energy the giraffes need. 
The result will be that giraffes will begin to suffer from starvation and die. When the giraffe population decreases, more trees and shrubs will grow. Once the plants are back to normal numbers, the giraffe population will again rebound. Because of the lions, these large population swings normally don't happen. Their hunting activities help maintain a more stable giraffe population and actually reduce the total amount of suffering. When one link in a food chain or food web becomes weakened or broken, the rest of the food chain and food web is affected. Drought causes trees and shrubs to die. Fewer plants means fewer giraffes survive. Fewer giraffes means the lions will also suffer. A food chain and you. How are you part of a food chain? If you ate a hamburger for lunch, the meat came from a cow that ate grass. The food chain started with plants, and the energy passed on to the cow, and then to you. A glass of milk follows the same route. A cow ate green grass, and provided milk, which you drink. You are the third link in that food chain. If you ate a piece of fish for dinner, the food chain started in the ocean or a river where microscopic producers grew. Now those being like phytoplankton or algae. Microscopic consumers dined on the tiny organisms. These little animals were then eaten by a small fish, which were eaten by larger fish, which may have been eaten by an even larger fish. The large fish were caught and sold to a supermarket. The fish wound up as a meal on your plate. If you ate broccoli, the food chain did not have many links. The broccoli grew in a garden, somebody picked it, boxed it up, and shipped it to a supermarket. It then became part of a meal for you, so that food chain only had two links. Okay, so for this ebook, I think I may end up skipping some of the, um, like extra information, like the technology link irradiating food. Good information there, but if you want to read that on your own, you certainly can. I'm going to stick to just the main text of the book today, just so we don't take too much time. So we're going straight to ecosystems next. So what is an ecosystem? Food chains and food webs exist in a large community of plants and animals. This community and its surroundings are called an ecosystem. There are many kinds of ecosystems. Some are on land, forests, grasslands, woodlands, and deserts, all examples of ecosystems. Other ecosystems are in water or marine environments, ponds, lakes, streams, rivers, and oceans. Food chains and food webs vary in different ecosystems because some plants and animals thrive better in some habitats, or places where they can live, than in others. Producers. A food chain may have four or five links. An organism's place or link on a food chain is called a trophic level. Organisms at the first level are producers called autotrophs. They produce their own food. There are two kinds of autotrophs, photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs. So what are chemoautotrophs? Photoautotrophs are organisms that live where there is sunlight. They use light to make glucose, a sugar, from carbon dioxide in the air and water. Photoautotrophs include plants, algae, and some kinds of bacteria. Next up, something we've learned about already, which is called photosynthesis. That's how plants make their own food for themselves. The process of changing light energy into food is called photosynthesis. The word photosynthesis means making something using light. Photo, meaning light, and synthesis, meaning uh, making something by combining parts into a whole. So photosynthesis usually takes place in the green leaves of plants. The leaves are green because they contain a green pigment called chlorophyll. The cells of a plant's leaves have tiny disks within their cells. These disks are called chloroplasts. Chlorophyll and other pigments in the chloroplasts absorb the energy of sunlight. The roots of the plant take in water and minerals from the soil. The water travels up the stem to the leaves. Carbon dioxide gas is absorbed into the leaves from the air. When light strikes the chlorophyll, it grabs the light energy and uses it to quickly change carbon dioxide gas and water into glucose, that type of sugar we mentioned before, and oxygen. Glucose allows the plant to grow and reproduce. It stores extra glucose as starch in its stems and roots. So photosynthesis there. In short, plants use energy from the sun, oxygen from the air, water from the ground, and synthesizes those in its leaves to create glucose or sugar that it uses for energy. Next up, chemoautotrophs. 
Chemoautotrophs live in ecosystems where there is no light, such as in the deepest areas of the ocean. Chemicals from inside the earth seep up through the underwater vents. Chemoautotrophs take energy from these chemicals to make glucose. So plants, sea plants that live way at the bottom of the ocean where there's no sun, they have to make their energy a different way from the chemicals in the ocean, not from the sun. Next up, autotrophs in water. Autotrophs that live in lakes, oceans, streams, and rivers are called phytoplankton. Floating in their watery environments, phytoplankton are so tiny that they can be seen only through a powerful microscope. These one-celled organisms, along with algae and some larger plants that grow only in water, are the primary producers in water. All right, so for the next level of organisms that can exist in a food chain or food web, we now have the consumers. Consumers in an ecosystem eat plants, other organisms, or both to get their energy and are called heterotrophs. Heterotroph is a Greek word that means other feeders. There are three kinds of heterotrophs, herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. Herbivores eat plants, carnivores eat other animals, and omnivores, such as us humans, eat both plants and animals. So first up, the herbivores. Herbivores are animals that mostly eat plants. They range from microscopic creatures called zooplankton to caterpillars and grasshoppers, giraffes and elephants, and cows and deer. Zooplankton and other tiny consumers drift on ocean currents. They are primary consumers because they eat primary producers. Most zooplankton are herbivores. Zooplankton include little crustaceans like shrimp, tiny squid, and even some very small fish. A common kind of zooplankton is krill, which are shrimp-like crustaceans. The krill provide food for larger animals such as seals and whales and fish. Some herbivores feed only on the liquids within plants. A butterfly drinks nectar from flowers by using a long mouth port called a proboscis. Hummingbirds have long beaks and long tongues that they use to drink nectar. Mammal herbivores, such as cows, sheep, moose, deer, and giraffes, are called ruminants. That means they have more than one stomach. These animals will graze during the day. The grass they eat will go first into the stomach called the rumen. Later, often at night, the ruminants will bring back up a mouthful of food called cud and chew it again. When swallowed, the cud will enter another stomach. So those were the herbivores that eat plants. Now onto the carnivores. Carnivores being animals that eat other animals. A mountain lion looks forward to a dinner of deer or porcupine. A South American jaguar will eat about anything it can catch, fish, alligators, turtles, or monkeys. Carnivores are predators because they catch and eat their prey. Many predators, such as spiders or frogs, work alone. Others, such as wolves or lions, work in groups. Predators are usually well prepared to catch their prey. Most can run faster than their prey. Predators also have powerful jaws and claws, or talons, so that they can catch and hold onto their prey. Certain predators have special advantages. Some snakes have poisonous fangs. Many predators also have excellent eyesight. An eagle can spot the movement of a moose miles away and quickly swoop down to onto it. Carnivores often have to put a lot of time and energy into catching their food. That's because their prey may have developed ways to avoid being eaten. Some prey use camouflage to escape the eyes of predators. Certain caterpillars look like leaves. A brown hare's coat changes in white in winter to match its snowy surroundings. Rabbits run in zigzags to avoid being caught. Prey such as skunks and beetles spray a horrible smelling stinging liquid at the predator. Some animals simply go underground when a predator attacks. Prairie dogs are rodents that live underground in large groups. Some prairie dogs act as guards. When they spot a predator such as a hawk or coyote, they warn the others. So one feature of any good carnivore should be sharp teeth that they can use to rip apart the meat of their prey. The teeth at the front of a carnivorous mammal's mouth are called canine teeth. These teeth are sharp and pointed. A lion uses these teeth to seize its prey. The back of the mouth has teeth that are sharp and more pointed than those in the front. When the carnivore clamps its mouth shut, these back teeth close up like blades. The back teeth are used to cut into the flesh of prey and rip off pieces. And for the third group of consumers, we have the omnivores. Animals that eat both plants and animals are called omnivores. Many animals are omnivores, including humans, like we said before. Omnivores have wide food choices. 
A grizzly bear is an omnivore that will eat just about anything. During the spring, a grizzly will kill and eat elk, but it will also find daisies, fish, and berries very tempting. In the summer, a grizzly will eat mushrooms, fireweed, and roots. As fall approaches, a grizzly will turn its attention to acorns, moths, pine nuts, roots, and mice. Now there's one other special type of consumer here called scavengers. Now what makes them unique? Well, scavengers are animals that come along after carnivores or omnivores have finished their meal. They eat the remains of dead plants or animals. Scavengers include crabs, vultures, and jackals. So those are the guys that come up and eat whatever's left after the carnivores and omnivores have finished feasting. Next up, we have uh, the third major group of animals we can, or living things, that we would find in a food chain or food web called the decomposers. Food chains end with decomposers. Decomposers break down the bodies of dead plants and animals to make new plants grow and new food chains begin. Here's how decomposers work. Insects eat berries growing on a bush. A weasel spots an insect and eats it to get energy. After a time, the weasel dies. Mushrooms and other fungi, or bacteria, decompose the weasel's body. Decompose meaning they, they break it down or cause it to decay. Decompose the weasel's body so it becomes nutrients in the soil for plants to grow. Dead plants and animals are called detritus. In a forest, detritus may include fallen trees, leaves, animal waste, and the bodies of dead animals. Detritus still has many nutrients, but plants cannot use these nutrients. There is no way that the roots of plants can absorb the fallen tree or the animal's body. The nutrients have to be broken down first by decomposers. Saprobes. Most decomposers are called saprobes, molds that grow on rotten oranges or saprobes. Bacteria in the air, soil, and water are another kind of saprobe. Bacteria are even in your body, such as in plaque, which is a sticky substance that forms on your teeth. Another example of a saprobe or decomposer. Fungi, or mushrooms, are saprobes that may look like plants, but they are not green and they cannot make their own food, so they're not plants. Unlike plants, fungi can survive in places where there is no light, such as underground or deep underwater. Mushrooms, molds, and yeasts are fungi. You've probably seen mushrooms growing in damp soil. What you cannot see is the main part of the mushroom growing underground. This is part of the mushroom has thin, thread-like tubes growing from it. Each tube releases a substance that breaks down detritus, and then the detritus is taken in through the tubes to feed the mushroom. Next up, food chains on land. The combination of climate, soil, water, temperature, and animals creates different ecosystems on Earth. Ecosystems can be broken down into two main kinds, ecosystems on land and ecosystems in water. Each of these ecosystems has its own food chains and food webs. Tropical rainforest food chains. Tropical rainforests exist mainly along the equator. These humid jungles receive a lot of moisture and heat. The top layer of trees is where powerful bird predators live. In the next level of trees, birds eat the fruits while monkeys and squirrels scamper across the branches. Birds, monkeys, and squirrels become the prey of predators, such as carnivorous birds and large animals like jaguars. In a lower level of trees, insects munch on leaves and tree frogs dine on insects. Lizards find the tree frogs tasty prey. The forest floor does not have many plants because the thick trees keep most of the sunlight from reaching the ground. Leaves tumble down, fruit falls and rots, and dead animals are here and there. Worms and snails find the forest floor an excellent source of food. In the rivers, fish eat insects that fall into the water. Large animals such as alligators or crocodiles eat the fish or other animals along the riverbank. Okay, real quick, I want to remind myself how many pages we were expected to read today. 4 through 28. Okay, so we're just about finished. We'll keep going. Grassland food chains. Grasslands often have patches of forest or trees sprouting through the meadows. Although grass provides food to many kinds of animals, the food chains depend on the location of the grasslands. On grasslands in North America, insects and mice eat the low stems of grass. Owls, hawks, coyotes, and wolves are their predators. 
On African grasslands, many large herbivores, such as zebras, gazelles, antelopes, and elephants roam. Zebras eat the tops of grass, while gazelles find the young plants delicious. Lions, hyenas, and other large carnivores hunt these herbivores. Next, woodland food chains. Many different kinds of insects burrow into trees, especially the bark. Woodpeckers eat insects by pecking into the bark with their beaks, then licking out the insects. Spiders also trap insects that live in the forests. Moth caterpillars eat leaves, and when the caterpillars change into moths, they become food for bats that fly through the night. Next up, desert food chains. Plants and animals that live in deserts have adapted to the conditions. Snakes, lizards, great horned owls, and golden eagles are common predators in a desert. They feast on kangaroo rats, jackrabbits, skunks, mice, or insects. Insects, such as grasshoppers and ants, get energy from the plants like cacti. That being the plural for cactus. And last major section for today, food chains in water. There are two kinds of water ecosystems. Fresh water, like those found in lakes and rivers and ponds, and oceans, where we'll find salt water. Fresh water ecosystems include lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams. Ocean ecosystems involve producers and consumers in the Earth's seas and oceans. So first up, the freshwater food chains. The primary producers in freshwater environments are phytoplankton. Zooplankton feed on phytoplankton, and animals like snails, clams, crustaceans, small fish, and frogs eat the zooplankton. Larger animals such as snakes, turtles, ducks, and large fish consume these smaller animals. Plankton that die fall into the deeper areas of the ponds and lakes to become energy for decomposers. In streams and slow rivers, some insect larvae build nests under stones to catch small animals and plants. The nests catch anything being washed along by currents. A small fish like a bullhead may eat the larva. A large fish or a bird of prey, such as a kingfisher, that guy, may consume the bullhead. A kingfisher can dive right into the water and grab a fish with its beak. So if those are the freshwater food chains, like the oceans and lakes, here we have ocean food chains. Oceans are the largest ecosystems in the world. Food chains in the ocean start with phytoplankton. And of course the zooplankton again feed on the phytoplankton. Small zooplankton are eaten by larger zooplankton, which are in turn eaten by fish. So kind of like with the freshwater food chains. Next up, swarms of fish such as herring swim through the plankton. A herring has spines on its gills. As the herring swims, it opens its mouth and water passes through. Plankton caught in the spines are swallowed. Tuna eat small fish like herring. They swim right into the schools of fish, snap their jaws around the fish, and eat them. Sharks also feed on smaller fish, usually by swallowing them whole or by tearing them into chunks. Albatross, that being a big bird, penguins, seals, and petrels also prey on fish. Humpback whales. Humpback whales in the Antarctic Ocean eat krill, tiny shrimp-like creatures. A humpback whale must eat millions of krill to get enough energy to power its huge body. These whales have strips of flesh in their mouths called baleen. Baleen filters krill, uh, krill out of the water. Other food chains exist in the tidal and shore areas of the oceans. Tides wash up phytoplankton and zooplankton into little pockets of space among rocks. Sea anemones, shellfish, and crabs eat the plankton. At the high tide area, mussels attach themselves to rocks. Starfish eat mussels by pulling their shells apart. Seabirds walk along the beach and jab their beaks into the wet sand. They try to find crabs, worms, and clams that have been burrowed into the sand. The seabirds dine on the one-celled creatures trapped in the grains of sand. And lastly, the delicate balance. Food chains and food webs work well when they are left alone but humans sometimes upset the delicate balance of food chains and webs. People often overfish or overhunt animals and ecosystems. When too many of one kind of animal is killed, the balance of nature in the ecosystem is disturbed. Humans also upset the balance of nature by removing the habitats of plants and animals. Cutting timber, farming, or building houses in cities destroys habitats. People can upset the balance by using pesticides to get rid of pests that attack crops. The pesticides destroy the insects, but also remain in the bodies of animals such as birds that eat the insects. The pesticide then passes up the food chain, even to make some humans sick. Some pesticides can cause the shell of birds' eggs to become soft so that fewer, bird, uh, fewer birds are hatched. 
Non-native plants and animals. Humans have introduced non-native plants and animals into ecosystems. These plants and animals upset the balance of nature. Swamp eels and zebra mussels are two non-native animals that threaten to break food chains. Swamp eels came from Asia. Now they live in Georgia and Florida. Swamp eels eat frogs and fish, taking energy needed by native animals to survive. Zebra mussels were mistakenly brought into the United States on ships that came from Russia. Zebra mussels have huge appetites and feed on plankton in the Great Lakes. They remove important nutrients and energy from water needed by small fish. Zebra mussels smother other animals, such as native mussels, crayfish, and lobsters, by growing on top of them. And lastly, the circle of life. The main source of energy for all living things is the sun. Energy is passed from one organism to another along a food chain. On a food chain, green plants and phytoplankton are the primary producers. Consumers of producers are herbivores. Carnivores consume herbivores. Omnivores eat both plants and animals. Decomposers remove dead plants and animals and return nutrients to the soil uh, for the plants to grow anew. Food chains are connected in a network called food webs, which make up the circle of life. And that, everybody, was food chains and food webs. So thank you so much for joining us for today's science reading. Keep up your fine work, and we'll see you in the next one. Take care, and have a great rest of your day.